All right. Good morning, everyone. Man, I just want to say how awesome it has been so far this morning. Y'all's hospitality has been amazing. Uh, I'm here this morning with my wife, Kaylee, and my son, Noah. Uh, Noah's a pretty interesting guy, okay? Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago, he, uh, he sends me a text message uh, from school while they're at football practice, and he says, hey, can I shave my head? And I'm like, what? You know? He's like, yeah, it's a team building thing. We're all doing it. And my response was, well, is everyone doing it? You know, because I thought maybe it was like, hey, we're all going to shave our heads. And then joke's on you. We're not. Uh, but he says, yeah. And so long story short, he shaves his head. My wife picks him up from school. And uh, here we are this morning, him, shaved head. But he's in that stage where it's growing out. And so uh, they, I seen him this morning. I got here to the church a little bit early. And, um, and I seen him, and I said, man, you didn't do anything with your hair, like, at all? And they simply replied, well, what's he supposed to do with it? So, so we are just uh, grateful uh, that your, your pastor, all the staff here, everybody's allowed us to be here. It's just an amazing time. Uh, and look, I'm going to talk to you about my story this morning, um, and then we're going to talk about some other things, and I think that that's fitting, because have you ever, like, invited people over to your house, and there's this one guy, and he shows up, and doesn't introduce himself, you don't know who he is, what he does, where he's from, you might even be questioning how he even get here, and then he shows up, and he just starts talking. Like, I mean, he is eating up all the dead air with just conversation, and you're like, who is this guy? Well, I'm not going to be that person this morning. I'm going to introduce myself to you, so that way, as you're sitting there and you're listening to me talk, it's not like, hey, there's this weird, sketchy, long-haired dude just up here talking to us, and we have no idea who he is. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning just uh, telling you who I am. And look, I also, I'm one of those feedback kind of guys. So I want to give you permission to just take a big, deep breath, exhale, and just have a good time this morning. Feel free to clap, feel free to cry, feel free to laugh, feel free to say amen, because um, I like to have a good time. I don't know about y'all. Do y'all like to have a good time, Eastwood Baptist? All right. Well, let's have a good time. <laughs> that wasn't very convincing. It's like, yeah. Y'all like to have a good time? Woo! Yeah, yeah. yeah all right, there we go. I was like, five people really like to have a good time here. Uh, and, and you know what? I think it's okay to have a good time because who the Lord sets free is free indeed. And whenever you walk in the freedom of what Christ has done for us, I think that that's something worth rejoicing about. So uh, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, anybody here familiar with Houston, Texas at all? Okay, right, probably from a different area. I'm going to just tell you. So I was from an area called Greens Point. Most people there called it Guns Point, all right? Extremely sketchy place. But growing up there, uh, I used to have to fight every day. I'd have to fight when I got on the bus, when I got off the bus, and everything in between. Until eventually I was just another kid in the neighborhood, and uh, people liked having me around. But growing up in this environment, all I had was my mom and my grandmother. Never knew my dad or anything like that. And uh, I got exposed to things at a very young age that most young people shouldn't get exposed to. Uh, selling narcotics, being in a gang, uh, all the things that come with living in that type of environment. And so by the time I was 12 years old, uh, I'd started selling drugs, smoking marijuana, uh, and I had gotten jumped into a gang. Well, just after my 13th birthday, my mom went into the hospital. Uh, she went into the hospital for tumors, and uh, she ended up being in there for almost an entire year. Uh, she would, they would go in, remove a tumor, another one would develop. They would go in, remove that tumor, and then another one would develop. And then ultimately, uh, there was some malpractice that happened during one of the surgeries. Uh, I remember going to the hospital room. Uh, she was riddled with a foreign body infection in her body. Uh, I would see her hooked up to the hospital bed with these tubes, just pumping fluid out of her. And during that time period, my life consisted of go to school, get out of school, go to the hospital, visit my mom, and then go back home and just kind of do 
all the things that I told you about a second ago. And uh, they end up getting rid of all the infection, or so they said. They sent her home, uh, and about a week later, I found her dead. I went to wake her up one morning, and she had passed away. It was on December 19th. Uh, I was 13 years old. Now, at the time, you're just kind of in it, and you don't necessarily know the lasting impacts that that will ultimately have. Now that I'm a counselor, uh, I, I can look back and see how those trauma moments really have affected my life. Um, but I remember the paramedics come in, they set me down, and they said, hey, we're sorry to tell you, but your mom passed away. And I remember crying for maybe 30 seconds, and then I just became angry. And then I spent the next several years of my life angry. I felt like that they were telling me something that I already knew. I didn't have anybody there to help me process what had just happened. So the only thing that I knew to do was get angry. Well, less than six months later, I get incarcerated for the first time. I'm still 13 years old. Uh, I, in my young 13-year-old mind, uh, would see this, um, this truck come in and out of the neighborhood all the time. And it, they would drop off food to all these places. And inevitably, it was a Schwann's truck. Anybody know what Schwann's is? It's like a food truck. Right? Well, in my young adolescent mind, I'm thinking, man, this dude's coming in. He's dropping off all this food. They got to be paying for it. Dude's got to have like a stack of money on him. And I got my first gun, and I thought, man, with this gun, I can do anything. Like, I could make money. I could have power. It's actually kind of funny looking back on it because I didn't even have a clip in the gun. It was just it was just a gun with one bullet in it, a little 25 Beretta, the barrel flipped up. I mean, but I thought, man, with this thing, like I could I could do anything. And so I devised this plan to rob the Schwann's truck. Okay? And so sure enough, the, the Swan's truck drives into the neighborhood. I run up on the guy, gun out, hey, give me your money. He freaks out. There's two boxes of ice cream sandwiches he has on his passenger side. He grabs the boxes, throws them at me. I'm like tripping. I ain't never did this before. So I just pick up the boxes. I run back to my mom and my grandmother's apartment in the back of the projects, and I'm there for about 30 minutes. And the, sure enough, the cops come get me. And I, I go to jail for the first time for an aggravated robbery charge at 13 years old. And all I got was two boxes of ice cream sandwiches. Okay? I wish I could make that up. But, but seriously. Well, the juvenile system, uh, they kind of showed me a little bit of grace because of my age. And, you know, my mom had passed away. And so they sentenced me to nine months of uh, TYC which is Texas Youth Commission, basically prison for people under the age of 17 in Texas. And so I go in there, still angry, still upset, but one thing that I've always been able to do is talk good, right? And so I had natural leadership ability, and I go in there, and I think it's a good idea to start a gang, and I turn nine months into two and a half years. So I end up being incarcerated from the age of 13 to 16 years old. I get out at 16, and I have all these aspirations of going to high school, getting a real diploma, uh, maybe getting a job and everything like that. Well, as it would turn out, the school didn't want me to go there, and I had gotten my GED while incarcerated. And so uh, that pretty much got shut down. And less than two weeks later, I'm back to doing what I was doing before, participating in gang activity, selling drugs. Well, while incarcerated, I had met a guy that uh, would tell me his brother was the guy to know and that I could get everything that I wanted at a very cheap price and make a whole lot of money. Turns out he wasn't joking, and uh, long story short, uh, I ended up making upwards of $60,000 a month selling drugs, had a pipeline from Houston to Columbia, South Carolina, and I had just turned 17 years old. Now, there's a lot people can say in regards to that, you know, a lot of uh, younger people today tend to hear something like that. I speak at, at juvenile facilities I all over the place, and, you know, they're like, man, that, that's a lot of money. You must have had, like, everything you wanted. But the reality of it is there's a lot of chaos and darkness that becomes associated with that. 
there's two sides of the coin. Yeah, there's the side of the coin where you have all this money and you're doing stuff and you're young and irresponsible. So you got cool shoes and cool clothes. And I went through nine cars in one year, right? But then there's the other side of that coin to where you get no well-sleeping, slept nights. Um, you're always worried about something bad happening. Uh, you're constantly dealing with anxiety and stress, and it's just honestly a miserable place to be. Uh, it didn't last that long, as it never does. Uh, when you meet somebody and they're like, man, I was selling all kinds of drugs for 20 years, I'm like, either you were really good at it or I don't believe your story. Because, man, it don't last that long. Uh, I end up getting incarcerated for a gang-related shooting in which a person dies. And so now I'm 17, about to be 18 years old. I'm sitting in Harris County Jail, and uh, my original charge was aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Then the victim died due to complications of the gun wound, and I end up getting murder, uh, up to murder too. And I hadn't even turned 18 years old yet. I end up going through the court process, um, which was a long, grueling process, and I want to note a couple of things, too. As you're going through these things in life, there's the how are you dealing with that that's on the surface, but then there's the psychological effect that it has on a person, right? And I can tell you to this day, uh, me and the good Lord are still working through some of those psychological processes that have occurred. It just tends to affect you. By the time I'm 18 years old, I'm sentenced to life without parole, and I go to prison. I go, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around, I'm going to be in here the rest of my life. Uh, then you start to have these reality set, uh, set in. I ain't never been in love. Uh, I've never worked a job. I had never really experienced anything. And then this is going to be the rest of my life. Meanwhile, prison wasn't that comfortable of a place for me. Um, because of where I was from and the things that I did. Uh, prison in Texas is, you know, massively driven by your racial profile, right? Well, I look like I'm Hispanic. I'm part of a black street gang, and I'm a white dude. So it was, it was tough. You never could get in with anybody. It was always a, it was a difficult thing. Again, psychological process that goes through and all that. Uh, I stay in there four and a half years, and then I ultimately get acquitted of the murder, beat the charges, and then I'm released from prison. Now, there's a whole long story involved in that. But to sum it up, one of my co-defendants, which was my best friend, uh, was arrested on the same murder charges. Well, while he was being apprehended on those murder charges, he got into a shootout with the police and unfortunately killed a police officer. He was then sentenced to death. He was sentenced to death row. He was given the death penalty. From death row, he wrote an affidavit uh, to the DA taking credit for the original murder, and that's ultimately how I was released, right? Now, that's just another thing that compiles on top of this level of trauma, right? Because that's not like that's a feel-good moment, right? I mean, here you are, uh, you know, I'm 20, 22 years old. I'm trying to wrap my mind around the fact I'm going to be in here the rest of my life. Um, meanwhile, trying to get comfortable anywhere. And the, I got lawyers that are telling me, hey, there's hope and, and everything else. And then it, what would seem like in a blink of an eye, all of a sudden I'm released and I'm right back in the same neighborhood I was in. And you know that it's only because somebody you were close to took credit for it. It just messes with your head. Uh, I get out, and then uh, I start moving all over Texas, thinking that's the answer. I move somewhere, work a job, get laid off. Move somewhere else, work a job, get laid off. Uh, we end up having my son. And then, long story short, I end up over in East Texas. And I'm working at a Chicken Express, and I'm thinking, look, if I could just work this job and, you know, pay my child support, then maybe I could be a dad, right? Uh, well, I get laid off from that job, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm destined to sell drugs. This is my life. And so I make a phone call to a friend, have some drugs brought up to Longview, and I'm about to just flood Longview. Well, around that same time period, I found out about my grandmother's health. Uh, she lived in Monroe, Louisiana. Little backstory. 
So my mom and my grandmother are originally from Monroe, Louisiana. In the early 80s, they moved to Houston. Well, I'm born in 89, and all I know is Houston, Texas, and everything else. After I was convicted of the murder, my grandmother ends up moving back to Monroe to be around family that she had. And so, as I'm taking my tour of Texas, moving around trying to figure it out, she's living in Monroe, Louisiana. It's around Christmas time. Uh, she had just gotten out the hospital, and her health wasn't too good, so I decided to go out there and visit her. And I'm standing outside talking to this lady who's my aunt, who I barely know, and they're telling me they're going to put her in a nursing home because insurance wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't pay for someone to be with her at night. And uh, for whatever reason, I'm like, well, I'll move out here. Now, in my mind, I was like, well, I can, I can move out there. You know, maybe I get a fresh start. Nobody knows me. I knew that I was going back to selling drugs, which was the only thing I knew for sure that I didn't want to do because I had had my son. And if any of y'all have seen him this morning, this dude looks exactly like me, right? He acts exactly like me, too. Now, I ain't never really been too afraid of people or anything else, but after he was born, the one thing that did terrify me was him having a life like mine. And so I go back to East Texas, give the drugs to my roommate, give him the keys to the little garage apartment I was staying in, load up, and I moved to Monroe, Louisiana to take care of my grandmother. Uh, I start staying with her, getting her back on her feet, and then I go everywhere looking for a job. McDonald's and Taco Bell wouldn't hire me. I mean, I couldn't catch a break nowhere. I mean, true story, I go into Taco Bell and do the interview, and I'm talking to them, and they're like, yeah, man, this, this sounds great. Uh, I was like, so I got the job. They're like, well, we're going to have to talk to a regional manager before we hire you. <laughs> it's crazy when Taco Bell tells you that, you know. And, uh, and then, so I'm going everywhere looking for a job. I'm driving down Thomas Road, which is one of the main roads in West Monroe, and I look over to the right, and I see this big brown building, and it has Duck Commander on it. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go in there and ask those dudes for a job. Well, my mindset was I'm going to go everywhere and put in an application. That way, whenever I'm telling people how I have to sell drugs because society won't allow me to get a job, I could say that I tried. And so I go in, put in the application. About another month goes by, nothing. I'm completely stressed out. Um, I'm broken is what I am, right? And, uh, and then I randomly get a phone call, and it's this guy named Blaze Thomas from Duck Commander, and he says, hey, man, we want you to come in for an interview. And I show up there, and this is after Duck Dynasty had taken off, right? So Duck Dynasty comes out. It's taken off. Sure, have y'all heard of Duck Dynasty? Okay, I'll just make sure. All right, it's taken off, and, and so uh, there was a time period where if you had a pulse, they hired you because we need people to come man the store, sell duck calls, put them together. Well, then they learned that's probably a bad idea. We probably should have a little bit of structure, right? And so... Uh, they bring in this guy, Blaze Thomas, who is a friend of theirs, to kind of, you know, get some organization and things like that. And so there I am sitting, waiting to go into my interview, and I see some of these guys, like, open up the door, look like they're checking out other things. But really, they're trying to see who is this tattooed individual sitting in here, right? And I see them close the door, and they're like, I have no idea who that guy is, right? I go in for the interview, and I sit down, and they're trying to fill me out because I didn't look like this back then, right? I had a taper fade tattoo, and I wore Dickies, you know? Any of y'all know what Dickies are? All right, I'm just making sure I'm in the right place, you know what I'm saying? All right. And, uh, and they're like, hey, man, how would you like to work here, this and that? And I said, I, I don't know what possessed me to say this, but I said, look, man, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really care if it's you or McDonald's. I just want to take care of my kid, and I don't want to sell drugs to do it. And they were like, okay, never heard that before. It's interesting. And, uh, and then the other guy goes, they go, well, if you got the job, when could you start? And I, like, stood up. I untucked my shirt. I said, I'll start right now. And then he kicks me out of his office. He's like, you got to go. And so it was kind of mixed reviews. I didn't really know how it was going. You know, it's kind of like when keeping it real goes wrong. Like, I was just trying to keep it real with you. Now you're not going to hire me. 
And I go back to my grandmother's apartment, and I'm, like, kicking myself. And uh, sure enough, two days later, they end up calling me. I missed their phone call five times. They kept calling me, right? It's stuff like this when you look back, you're like, okay, good Lord is doing something that I didn't recognize at the time. And ultimately end up taking the job. I started that next Monday folding clothes for $8 an hour, and I just went in there and I went to work. Uh, I grew up totally atheist. I, I, I never believed in God at all. Uh, didn't have any relationship with Jesus or anything, and I knew what these guys were about. And so whenever they'd come in and they'd try to talk to me, I'd be like, hey, man, that's cool. Don't come to me with no Jesus stuff. I don't really care. And uh, they said something to me that changed everything. Um, they, they didn't open a Bible. They didn't point to any verses. They didn't tell me how my sin was going to send me uh, to doom. What they did was just tell me the words, I love you. And it was something about them saying, I love you, and then backing that up with their actions that just did something to me because I had never experienced that before. They gave me more and more responsibility because they liked the way that I worked. They would ask, how did I get there? Because I ain't from there. I would tell them, and then they're like, man, you're here for a reason. And I'm like, bruh, I said no Jesus stuff, you know? And, uh, and they would just say, hey, well, it's cool. We love you, man. And then they'd invite me to church. And so I ultimately decided to go to church. Uh, I went the first time, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, all right, here's the plan, okay? I'm going to come to church. They're going to see me coming to church. They're going to give me a raise or something, you know? And so I go to church. I sit down, and I listen, and I'm like, man, this is all fake. You know, this guy's probably driving a Mercedes. It's funny now that I work at the church. <laughs> Ain't nobody driving a Mercedes, you know? But, but I'm just, I'm so judgmental, so closed off and everything else. Man, let me tell you something. There's power in just putting your behind in the right place, okay? Because you ain't even got to show up with the right attitude and God might do something in you. And so I, I go back to the office that next day and I'm like, all right, woo, got that out of the way. Don't got to do that again. Well, then nobody mentioned seeing me at church. And I'm like, ah, I got to go again. <laughs> so I go again, and then I go again, and the more I went, the more I listened. And everything that didn't make sense made sense if I put God in the equation. I used to base my life on science and logic. Scientifically, I should be dead. And logically, I should be in prison the rest of my life. And I wasn't in either one of those spots. And the only thing that could ever make that make sense was if there's a God and he has a plan and a purpose for my life. And so I didn't have this road to Damascus moment. I didn't have a burning bush. But what I had was just a simple open-mindedness. And I said, you know what, God, if you're real, then show me. I opened up this Bible. I started reading it. And guess what happens? He shows you. And about a month later, I'm getting baptized by Phil, right? Yeah. And, in, in, like, if we were making this story up, that'd be a great place to stop the story. But, but this is real life, right? And so I get baptized, and it's, like, off to the races, zero to 100 real quick. It's like one day I'm, uh, I'm folding clothes for $8 an hour. The next day uh, I'm hanging out with Luke Bryan and Jason Aldean, and I'm going on these hunts, and they're putting cameras in my face. We start filming Duck Dynasty and everything else. People are asking me to speak places because of where I've come from, and now I know Jesus, and it was just too much too quick, Right? And I started living like this double life. You know, it's funny. The Israelite people were in captivity in Egypt. And then they were set free from Egypt. And then they were supposed to go to the promised land, right? Well, if you look on a map, geographically, from where they were delivered in Egypt to the promised land, it should have only taken them 11 days to get there. They turned an 11-day journey into a 40-year way of life. Why? Why? They were stuck in the same mindset. They had been set free from Egypt, but Egypt hadn't been set free from them. And that was the same thing for me. I'd been set free and walking in the newness and the freedom of what Christ had, 
but I wasn't fully living it yet. I still had that old mindset. And so I would go from 9 to 5. I'm talking about Jesus. If, they, if, you, if you fly me out to come speak, I'm talking about Jesus. And then I'd get home, I'd smoke marijuana, drink, and sleep around with women, right? And I would think, it's all good. Grace abounds. I got Jesus. He knows my heart. As it would turn out, it's pretty black and white. There is no gray area. And I was trying to live in a gray area that don't exist. And so, needless to say, I ended up getting arrested again for a DWI and a possession charge. And I'm sitting in jail, and I'm asking myself, how does this happen? I got Jesus, right? And then the Holy Spirit hits me like a ton of bricks. And it's like, hey, man, either you're for me or you're against me. You can't go around here and proclaim me and then live however you want to live. It don't work that way. And so I was convicted, and it finally became real to me. It's like, okay, all right, I see what you're saying. But it's pointless. Everything's over anyways, right? I mean, they got to fire me. This was three days before my episode aired on Duck Dynasty, right? And so I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm like, man, y'all got to gotta get rid of me. This is all pointless. And to my surprise, Willie Robertson and uh, one of my mentors, his name's Grant Taylor, he's general man manager of Buck Commander at the time. They come get me out of jail. They let me keep my job. They just tell me to do two things. They said, sell your vehicle because you ain't even got a driver's license. You ain't never had a driver's license and to move into a Celebrate Recovery Home, which was a sober living home there in West Monroe, operates out of our church. And so reluctantly I did. I go in there, got into a little bit more trouble, just with the wrong attitude, and ultimately came to a place to where it was like, you know what, I don't, I don't want to go from life in prison to the most popular reality show in history and then the end of this story say yeah he gave his life to Jesus but he was more concerned with his own life that he couldn't quite grasp what God was calling him to do and so I finally said you know what I give up here I am whatever you want to do however you want to do it whenever you want to do it I'll do it and I just fully surrendered started working the program of Celebrate Recovery, um, started doing everything that I needed to do, and uh, ultimately became an addiction counselor through that. Uh, God blessed me. That was something that I didn't want to do. I remember they offered me the job as an addiction counselor, said they pay for my schooling and everything. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'll never do that. Uh, it's funny how that works. And uh, ended up becoming one of the most sought after and highest paid addiction counselors in the state. Um, I, now, uh, as of three years ago, uh, roughly, I'm working full time at the church as the director of Celebrate Recovery. Ended up living in those sober living homes for two years. And uh, I now own those homes. And um, been blessed to be able to speak all over the country and proclaim Jesus, not myself but proclaim Jesus and what he can do with a broken man whenever you fully surrender to him. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, there, there's a lot of cool things that you get to do in that, right? My young people over here, you might think, man, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. All my coolness is going to go away. No, it's actually a whole lot cooler. You know what I mean? You get to do cool stuff, get to tell people uh, about how good God is and experience things. And so uh, I had uh, a little bird tell me that y'all are planning on having a celebrate recovery here at this church. And so I want to encourage y'all this morning, and I want to kind of talk about celebrate recovery because the guy that you see standing here today would not be standing here today if it wasn't for the Christ-centered program that celebrate recovery is. And so CR uh, is just that. It's a 12-step recovery program that is Christ-centered, and it helps people find freedom with their hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Uh, now, most of the time when we hear about people in recovery, we think someone who struggles with substances, right? Like, man, you know, uh, we need CR because there's people that are struggling with addiction in our area, and that's very much true. Uh, but CR is a process that helps people with any kind of struggle. 
Uh, and 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 I'm gonna just tell you, I, I know, no matter who you are, everyone under the sound of my voice has struggled with something, right? And so many people see hear this word recovery, and then they just think, man, all right, it's about the drug addicts and alcoholics. Man, I have had my life blessed by people that have gotten in to celebrate recovery, and their struggle was anger. Their struggle was depression. Their struggle was grief. Their struggle was anxiety, sexual temptation, pride, codependency, and so many other things. See, Celebrate Recovery isn't just a ministry to help the people that are getting high or getting drunk. Celebrate Recovery is a program that helps people, period. It doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter where you're from. doesn't matter what kind of struggle you have or not. One of our elders, his name's Robert Abels, man. He's uh, been he's been just a huge blessing to my life and many others. Um, he comes to celebrate recovery, and he's the elder of a church, and uh, and he shows up and it's like, man, Robert, what's your struggle? He says, well, uh, my struggle is wanting to quit, and it's like wanting to quit. Most of us are looking forward to that. We're like, hey, this. I'm just waiting on my, my day to ride off in the sunset and everything else. But I just don't, I don't know if throughout Scripture Jesus said, hey, man, do A, B, C, and D, and then, hey, go ahead, just sit down, you're done, and then uh, I'll call you on home one day. I just don't see that nowhere. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, I, I've really been having to fight the thought of uh, just riding off into the sunset. You know, I've done a good work. I've been faithful. Uh, I've served the Lord in a mighty way. And the thing that I have to fight, the struggle that I'm giving up and the struggle that I'm working through is the struggle of just wanting to stop and just be comfortable. And that's a powerful thing. That is a very powerful thing. And, and you've heard through my story how well CR can help someone, but it's not just about CR, right? Because the program itself isn't a savior, all right? The reason why Celebrate Recovery is so effective is because it's a vehicle to drive people to the great physician. It is not claimed to be the end-all, be-all. It does not claim to be the thing that, hey, you just work these 12 steps and then keep that going, go to meetings every day for the rest of your life, and you won't ever get high or drunk again. It doesn't claim to be that. What it does is it simply drives you to the one that can set you free. And, and that is what it does. Anyone who is struggling needs to get to Jesus. And CR is just one of those vehicles that can bring people to know him. And I'm going to share some scripture with you this morning. And I want to tell you a couple of ways uh, that that can work. Uh, we're going to be in we're going to be in the gospel of Mark. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your phones, you know, all my people that read the word on your phone. Amen. Uh, I often joke with my church whenever I'm speaking, I'm like, if you got Facebook but not the good book on your phone, there's a problem, you know? But I want you to go to Mark chapter 5 with me. We're going to start in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was there by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she only grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? 
Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. And he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, John, the brother of James. Uh, when they, they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, while the commotion and wailing, the child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. They went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha come, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up, walked around as she was 12 years old. At this time they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And I'm going I'm to give you a couple of reasons why. But first, I'm going to give you uh, a, little, a little bit of insight. I'm going to try to paint this picture for you. At my church, we joke around about this, but I'm going to give you what we like to call the HBSV version of the Bible. That's the homeboy street version, okay? All right. And so my man Jesus, right, he's crossed over the lake. He's got this huge crowd of people around him. Everybody's pressing against each other. I'm talking Taylor Swift concert crowd people just bumping into each other, right? And everybody's just walking, and they're bumping into each other. And then there's this guy, Jairus. He comes up. He falls to Jesus' feet. And he says, hey, man, I need your help. My daughter's dying, right? That's called desperation, right? Because it says Jairus was a synagogue ruler. Synagogue ruler, yeah, because if I'm not mistaken, wasn't the Pharisees, the ones that ultimately told Jesus that he wasn't who he said he was and had him killed. So that means that this guy, who's a, a ruler in a synagogue, basically said, I don't care what any of my friends or anybody else thinks. Like, I hear this guy can save my daughter, and I'm so desperate that I'll do anything. And so he goes and he falls to his feet and he says, hey, man, I need your help, right? Right? Desperation is the doorway that breakthrough walks through. If you want to experience a breakthrough, there has to be a level of desperation. Enough desperation that you ignore what everybody else around you is saying and you go and you fall to the feet of something that can help. And so Jesus says, you know what, man, let's go, right? And so if you could picture this, imagine Jairus pushing people out the way, moving people, and he's telling you, come on, Jesus, keep up. He's leading them to the house, right? Hey, come on, just take care of my daughter. Like, hey, everybody move. And then as he's walking, he's got the solution with him. They're coming, a little bit of hope. In the middle of nothing, everything, he just stops walking, Jesus, and says, who touched me? Well, everybody around him is like, say, bro, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. And he goes, no, 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 who touched me? Right, And then this woman comes up who had been dealing with the disease for 12 years. Right, Now this woman had spent all the money she had. She had done everything that she could. She's been rejected by everybody because back in that time period, you were known as ceremonially unclean. If you were dealing with that, you couldn't even be in town. And she's standing out there. She says, you know what, man, if I can just, if I can just touch his clothes, right? And, and you're talking about a woman that had been bleeding for 12 years. Imagine how sickly and just no energy she had. But she was desperate enough that she crawled her way through a crowd of hundreds of people just to touch Jesus. Desperation is the doorway that breakthrough walks through. And so she gets there, she touches him. He's like, who touched me? They're standing there. It says that she gave him the whole truth. That takes a while, right? And then Jairus gets the worst possible news that he could ever get. Somebody comes up to him and says, hey, don't even worry about it. Don't even, don't even bother the teacher. Your daughter's dead, right? Now imagine being Jairus in that moment. You have the solution. The solution's on the way. He's coming to help. Your desperation has brought what you thought your breakthrough was going to be. And then because he's standing there talking to this random woman, now my daughter's dead. You think Jairus was happy? No. Jairus was broken. But Jesus turns around and says, don't be afraid, just believe. I ain't no theologian or nothing, but if I'm Jairus in that moment, it's not like I'm going to just believe. It's not like I'm going to just be, okay, yeah, you're right. You know? 
No, I'm going to be hurting. So I want you to imagine this. It goes from Jairus leading Jesus to his house to Jesus leading Jairus to his house. Men, sometimes we got to let Jesus lead. And then they get in there, and there's a bunch of wailing and crying and commotion going on. Jesus says, that girl's not dead. She's asleep. He puts them out the house, right? And then he goes in there. He raises the girl from the dead, and he says, hey, give her some Chick-fil-A. She hungry, right? The reason why I love this story is because it talks about how desperation can produce some things in your life, right? This woman was freed from her suffering because she was desperate enough to crawl through a crowd of hundreds of people. Jairus showed up for a healing, but he got a resurrection because he was desperate enough to go to a man that everybody said was fake. Some of y'all under the sound of my voice may be the person that's desperately suffering. You may be desperately suffering and you're the person that needs to get to Jesus. Celebrate Recovery is that vehicle to get you to Jesus, to bring you to your breakthrough. Because what you show up for may not be what you get, but what you get will be way better. Jairus showed up for a healing and he got a resurrection. resurrection. Some of y'all might just show up to be healed from your suffering and have your entire life resurrected. There's another group of people that I want to talk to this morning. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even an outside door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing in a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was laying on. And Jesus saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic, Son, your, sons are, your sins are forgiven. Right? I want to stop right there. Sometimes it takes people who care about those who are suffering to be willing to make some room and carry. See, whenever churches begin to start celebrate recoveries, oftentimes they think, hey, man, that's going to be real good for those people that are struggling. It's going to be real good. I'm going to stand back. I'm going to tie a little bit of money to the cause, call it a day, right? I could just tell you just by being here, this church is ready for Celebrate Recovery. The hearts that I've felt since I've been here, just your vibe in general, I mean, but I'll tell you, it's not just about supporting from a distance, it's about showing up. And maybe that's you this morning, and you feel confident in your faith, strong and in a good place. I think God calls us to be the ones willing to bring people through the roof if we have to. If you're that strong person and you feel confident in your faith and you're walking in the freedom of Christ, then I want to tell you, God's calling you to be the one to bring somebody up on the roof, make a hole, and lower them down to the great physician. And you get to be a part of what God is doing. CR is the roof. And some of you just got to show up and be willing to take part. And be willing to bring people who are suffering to the one that can heal. It says in verse 6, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that This was what they were talking about in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Man, let me tell you something that will be extremely powerful. And that is whenever you see somebody that is suffering, broken down, can't do anything, walking around with their mat because they no longer need it. 
That is a powerful thing for people to see, and it'll have people amazed. Look, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm not that great at a whole lot. But the only reason why the good Lord allows me to stand up here before you with a microphone is because I'm willing to tell people about the mat I no longer need. That is a powerful thing. What do you think happened to the people that carried the man on the mat up to the roof? Do you think they were just like, yeah, all right, good job. We're never doing that again. No, no. See, God gets the glory, but we get the encouragement. Whenever we faithfully serve him and we bring somebody that's suffering up on the roof, make the whole, get them to celebrate recovery, let's celebrate recovery, drive them to Jesus, and then they get that healing, you know what happens next? You become encouraged, and you're like, let's go, baby. We're doing this again. And I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep carrying. I'm going to keep digging if I got to, to get more people to this man named Jesus. So that may be you this morning. You may be the person that is struggling. And you know what? Your struggle has made you desperate, and that desperation is going to lead you to a breakthrough. And getting to celebrate recovery, getting involved with celebrate recovery could be the thing that produces something that you didn't even show up for or intend. Could have your entire life resurrected as a result from it. Or you might be the person that's strong in your faith. You might be the person that, that knows who the great physician is. You might be the person that knows how to get him there. And all the good Lord is asking you to do is show up and start putting your hands on stuff. Show up and start carrying people. Show up and start digging holes. Be the person that's willing to help. Whenever this happens, right, and the people that are suffering show up, the people that are faithful show up, and everybody gets on board and starts rowing in the same direction, I promise you without a shadow of a doubt, Celebrate Recovery will transform your entire church. And whenever I say transform, it don't mean it'll get worse. What it means is you'll have a bunch of set free people living and participating in what God is doing here at Eastwood Baptist. And that is a powerful thing. Man, we have a joke at my church, right? At my church, the joke is, uh, you know, dress code. They're like, man, what's the dress code? I said, well, normally I tell people face tattoos, but don't, don't feel like you got to. You know what I mean? I'm like, dress code? We ain't got no dress code. The only, time, only reason I tuck my shirt in is because I'm visiting y'all today. You know? It gets you a wife that tells you the truth, by the way. All right? Even when you don't like it. Okay? This is a funny story. My wife, right? I walk, I walk out into the lobby to greet her and stuff. Instantly, your shirt looks terrible. <laughs> yeah? She's like, untuck it. It don't look right. I'm like, I'm already committed to tucking it in. <laughs> I've already <laughs> There's no going back at this point. You know? But, man, it'll transform your church. And that's my encouragement to all of you is that you're a place, um, is that you're a place for people to come to who are suffering. Not just because, hey, we got a place, we got a thing called CR, but we're a place to come to when you're suffering because uh, we're people that carry. We're people that dig holes. We're people that get in and get after it. Um. You know, our church, WFR, man, it, it, uh, it was completely transformed by Celebrate Recovery uh, 20 years ago. This is our 20th year of doing CR. And a guy by the name of Mac Owen came down front one Sunday morning uh, about 24 years ago and said, hey, I got a drug problem. And just like most churches, WFR said, okay, uh, I don't really know what to do with that information. We're going to pray for you, brother. You know what I'm saying? So they pray for him, and they're like, we don't really know how to help him. It's a drug problem, you know. And, but they start carrying. They start digging. They start figuring it out. They start something called overcomers in one of the little off buildings of the church. That then develops into what we now have as Celebrate Recovery today. Started with 30 people, and now we are the largest Celebrate Recovery in the nation. We have an average of 500 people every Friday night. You never know. You never know what God's going to do with 
a little bit of faithfulness. And look, uh, I'm about to get ready to close out this morning, uh, but I want to share a quick little story with you. And I know we're going to have some church leaders up here prepared to pray for y'all. If you have anything that that you need to pray about, uh, if you want to know Jesus, maybe you're here for the first time and don't know him, um, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. Uh, But there's a story about 1980s Romania that I love telling people. In 1980s Romania, there was a devastating earthquake that happened. Uh, some 20,000 people misplaced. Several people, several thousand people died instantly as a result of this earthquake. In that morning, there was a dad. He got up out of bed that morning. He went into the kitchen, put together a little bit of breakfast as his son walked into the kitchen ready with his backpack for his dad to take him to school that morning. They do what they do at the house. They get in their car. They drive to the school. Dad pulls up to the school. He lets his son out of the car, and then he takes off and drives on to work like he does every other morning. But as he's driving to work, something happens. There's a ripple in the road. Things begin to fall, and, he, and this massive earthquake takes place. And so the dad, after the earth quits shaking, After everything quit moving, he turns the car around. He goes back to the church, or goes back to the school. He gets to the school, and he sees that it's completely leveled, complete rubble. There's people standing outside. They're like, man, there's everybody's just hurting and broken. They're crying. They're like, man, there's no way. There's no way anybody survived this. Uh, And... He goes to about the approximate location of where his son's classroom would have been, and uh, he just starts pulling rocks, starts moving rocks out of the way. And people are telling him, hey, it's no point. It's useless, right? There's no way anybody could have survived this, but he's just pulling rocks. 24 hours goes by. He's pulling rocks. And people realize, man, this is just him grieving. He's just doing this because he's got to say that he tried. And then on the 36th hour, the dad moves this big rock and unearths a cavern that had 13 students and one teacher in it. One of those students being his son. He comes out of the hole and he says, I told him, Dad, I told him that you would come for us. Now that's a story of an earthly father. When we have a godly father, that the word says, if we being evil can give good gifts to our children, how much more will he do for us? It says that he will do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever think, ask, or imagine. That's who we have pulling the rocks off of us. So if you're stuck in a cavern and you're waiting on a Savior, I just want to tell you this morning he's available. Matter of fact, he's already standing on the top moving the rocks to get you closer to him. I'm going to say a prayer for you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for being a God that never stops chasing us. We thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your mercy. We thank you for who you are and what you do for us. God, I just want to pray for Eastwood Baptist Church this morning. Uh, As they get ready to start to celebrate recovery, I pray that it it is fruitful. I pray that the people that can help show up in a a mighty way and, and they just faithfully show up to serve you. God, I pray for anybody under the sound of my voice that is suffering. Not, not with just drugs, alcohol, or, but maybe the suffering that nobody can see at the surface. That they find a, a way to be desperate and to chase after you. God, I pray that you bless this uh, ministry uh, that, that you're bringing to this church and that uh, you just allow it to be the thing that transforms this church in a mighty way. God, we love you so much and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.